Greetings, I'm Pete Ring. My background in military aviation is fighters and helicopters. I conduct these chats on behalf of Air Force Association New South Wales, Wings Magazine, and our channel, uh, our YouTube channel, Wings Australia. And this morning I'm talking to Ron Glue, many call him Gluey. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to Gluey about his experience as a young bloke in Vietnam. Um, and I'll just get a few questions in to start with to give you a little bit of background. Um, but I mainly want to focus on the flying side. Um, so just as we start here, Gluey, good morning. Good morning. You had a rather spectacular time in Vietnam, as many people did. Um, what aircraft did you operate in? Uh, I operated with the Caribou. Okay, and in brief, what was the role of the Caribou? The Caribou was um, supporting the Amer uh, MACV America in um, supplying outposts, um, uh, specifically where the Caribou uh, was very, very suited to be having short takeoff and landings and landing on uh, basically unprepared strips. Right. So how many crew were there? There were three crew, uh, and then uh, they added assistant loadmasters, which made it four. So why did they add an assistant loadmaster? The uh, the amount of work that uh, had to be carried out because the uh, cargo being carried amounted from ammunition, uh, fuel, Agent Orange, cattle, pigs, um, <laughs> ducks, uh, you name it, and um, the turnaround had to be pretty quick when you got into the these outposts. Okay, so, uh, they weren't a very friendly friendly environment, and uh, uh, they brought the assistant loadmasters in. What what was it particularly about the caribou that made it suited to that role? Just in brief, why was the caribou so suited to do the operations you just spoke of? Well, mainly because, as I say, the uh, the particularly very short takeoff and landing, um, able to carry a, a pretty reasonable weight, um, or um, manoeuvrable within restricted areas, and. Um, uh, they are perfect for that role. No other, no other aircraft could have done it. So, what was your role to kick off with? Uh, well, I, I was initially I was a general hand uh, in Thirty Eight Squadron, and um, I, I came back from uh, Malaysia in thirty in sixty one, and um, I, I was posted Thirty Eight Squadron, and then from there on in, it's it's a bit of history. Okay, just quickly. What was Wallaby Airlines? Wallaby Airlines was um, a call sign given to the actual RAF transport flight Vietnam, as it was called in those days when I was there, early days. And um, uh, Chris Sugden, our CO, uh, and had uh, he was in the first flight, I was in the second, as uh, first changeover. He um, he was with the Americans um, liaising. And they said, "What's your call sign?" He said, "Kangaroos," <laughs> and the Americans couldn't couldn't uh, uh, pronounce it. They were and um, Chris thought about it. He said, "Well, what about Wallaby?" Oh, Wallaby! That that was it. <laughs> and um, our call sign there was Wallaby. Uh, consequently, we, uh, in the longer term, um, just after I left, we became known as uh, became known as Wallaby Airlines. <laughs> um, and and transitioned into 35 squadron. And so Chris Sugden, I believe, was uh, somewhat of a forthright CO who looked after his troops and made sure that um, that the aircraft, the uh, outfit, was a pretty strong one. He was an outstanding, and we were lucky. We got uh, in my time, we got two outstanding leaders. Chris uh, set up, set us up um, the initial group. Um, the Americans put us on the base and uh, gave us accommodation. And this is here, so I'm repeating from memory. Um, got us accommodation. The accommodation was right near the uh, latrine lines. And the latrine lines, <clears throat> every day, um, the latrine lines uh, were discharging into 44-gallon drums, and those 44-gallon drums were set fire to with diesel and uh, <laughs> petrol every morning. So it wasn't a very good environment. It lasted about about a week to two weeks, and Chris um, hi, um, rented a couple of villas in 
in Vung Tau itself. And uh, we moved into, well, they moved into Vung Tau at that time. When I arrived, the uh, I was in uh, Villa, uh, Villa Nong Hak, and uh, that uh, there was an environment that was strange to say the least, but really good. We weren't, <laughs> given, we weren't inundated with smells. Well, I was thinking that that might have been smells of food rather than the smells of sewage. <clears throat> yeah. Did, did you, um, just generally speaking, without getting specific yet, but were the caribous being shot at in in the in their operations? Oh, consistently. Yeah. Consistently. And mainly with what um, um, small arms or? Oh uh, no, not only small arms, but uh, up to I believe there's up to fifty calibre. Uh, we were very, very lucky. In in, in that, Chris was a uh, magnificent leader. Uh, the Americans would fly in with their with their caribous and uh, at low level, and they would be there's a high casualty rate. Uh, we would come in at a, an elevation of about three to four thousand feet and actually spiral down over the over the airfield. So the airfield could give us uh, uh, quite a bit of protection, and we were in a strict restricted area. So the firing was from a, a greater distance, yeah. and uh, our final final approach was were very very short. The cargo you, you were carrying was um, very was varied. Um, you mentioned animals, and just go back through that again. Well, we we carried uh, we carried fuel drums, we carried bombs, we carried ammunition. Um, generally. Uh, on our milk runs, which were, uh, th- we had three milk runs a day, which was the Nat- Natrang, Da Nang, and down the Delta. Um, those milk runs, we would be carrying in supplies for the outposts, and they were live supplies. Um, we would bring in half a dozen cattle or more. Um, <laughs> um, pigs, in, in, sometimes in, in containers, sometimes not. Um, the cattle were just freestanding. Uh, ducks, um, uh, chickens, not not a lot of chickens, quite a lot of duck, um, and just generalised items like cooking oil and et cetera, et cetera. During your airborne operations, what, what sort of environments were you confronted with while you were transporting this cargo? Because I believe there were some cargoes too that um, posed the threat in themselves. But yes. What sort of things were you handling? The, the most, the hardest thing, we also carried, amongst other things, VC, uh, VC suspect prisoners uh, with escorts. We carried a lot of Arvin troops back from the outpost to Saigon. They were all, all heavily armed, and we had to make sure that um, we had their weapons and uh, particularly grenades, which we put, stored down the back or threw out as we got over a, a safe area. Um, uh, we could never be sure exactly what was going to happen. Uh, with the prisoners, you had to be very, very careful. And so, you know, um, they were handcuffed or tied up or whatever the case may be. In a lot of cases, they were, um, they had hoods on, um, or blindfolds. And, um, that, that was interesting to say the least. Um, the other thing we found, uh, the most confronting thing, is Vietnamese are not very good with uh, air travel. They get air sick very, very quickly. And we'd give them bags, but uh, nine times out of ten, the bag wasn't used and they'd go everywhere. Ah. And uh, um, all credit to our ground crew because by the time we got in, they hosed them down, cleaned them up overnight, and we were ready to go the next morning. So that's some of the things. We carried bombs, live bombs, um, that... Uh, particularly from Da Nang, uh, where we were loaded with them and did a short trip out to sea, on and the bombs were loaded on pallets and we just dropped them in the ocean. Uh, that was interesting, and uh, um, generally um, issues like that. It was just a, a can-do attitude when we had the, you know, the, when when something had to be done, um, they actually asked um, Wallaby Airlines or RTFV to do it. We were called in to do all sorts of things. Right. And so what were the bombs you were dropping in the in the in the ocean? Uh, they're generally 250 pounders. Yeah. Um, and um they they had been armed and supposedly made safe. 
and knowing Americans, you know what it's like. And uh, they were loaded in pallets of about uh, oh, about half a dozen. We had two pallets uh, strapped on the pallets. We had the uh, the runners on on the floor, and uh, we just when we got to an area where we could dump them, we just started to climb, uh, release the straps, and away they went. Would have been a bit a bit of a change of um, center of gravity as they went out the back, would they? Uh, somewhat. <laughs> it's a big jump. You made sure you you had your harness on, so you didn't hit the roof. No, you so they didn't go with the bombs. Go out with the bombs. Were there any instances of people loadmasters brushing with death through the open back door? Not really. Um, you were pretty, you're pretty uh, pretty aware of uh, keeping yourself strapped to the aeroplane. Yeah. Well, uh, it was a given that you flew with the upper flap, uh, upper door open. Um, there's no air conditioning and it's bloody hot. And um, you flew with that. If you had to get up for any length of time or you went down the back, you know, you had to relieve yourself at times. And there were some interesting, interesting occasions there, um, particularly if you had to go for a, for a number two after eating an American mess. Um, <laughs> Uh, hanging out the back on a strap was always a, <laughs> an interesting situation. Um, but um, the urinal was down back down on the left hand side uh, of the back ramp, and uh, uh, we never, never, you know, we just passed and closed the door, closed the door sufficiently, walked down the back. We never used a strap there, so uh, you know, it was that the only trouble was the pilots wouldn't have seen you go down to use the urinal. And you got ready to uh, to use it. Uh, the aircraft decided to <laughs> do all sorts of funny things. <laughs> uh, yeah, they weren't doing that on purpose. <laughs> oh no, oh definitely not. We did get revenge because when they went down the back, we took over control. So, at any stage, did you ever did you feel like you there was enough firepower from below coming towards the aeroplane that made you um, want to? Um, uh, but it did cause you any grief, cause you any I think I, Yeah. I think initially, um, yeah, uh, you know, we pulled into uh, the Ashour Valley under a bit of fire, but we, nothing hit us. Uh, yes, we did get hit once there. And um, when I was there initially, the first couple of weeks, I was wearing a black jacket, which was useless any bloody way. Um, so what we did was... Uh, uh, in, when we were going to a hazardous situation, we generally threw a flak jacket in. We didn't know, but uh, usually when we were called out for a special purpose, uh, we took a flak jacket and we sat on it. Take <laughs> the jewels. Do you think that um, you, you thought the flak jacket was not the, the best, the type of bullets coming at you? Uh, it just, um, well, it, it depends. If we're flying straight and level, the bullet would be coming straight up through the floor. Yeah. Uh, and that happened once with uh, one of our ladies sitting on the uh, on the esky in the uh, in the radio compartment, and it pulled up just on the top lid before it hit him. Oh. <laughs> so that was interesting as well. But that's the sort of thing. Most of it, uh, most of any hits we got was usually when we we're coming in or or departing. Never, never any real altitude. We had been fired at. At high altitude, and you could hear a little pop, but uh, nowhere near us. So, when you did your approaches to airfield, what sort of um, uh, cargo delivery? What what different cargo del deliveries did you use? Oh, uh, we we it was just landing and um, dropping the ramp and getting them off. Um, we just rolled drums off uh, the cattle. Uh, they'd jump off and. Uh, uh, all the other stuff, the Americans would just back in an old uh, an old um, open vehicle and would throw it in. That's it. Um, say good day, and then we're off. It's only yeah. usually fifteen minutes, twenty minutes turnaround. So did you do airdrops? No, not really. We uh, airdrops were weren't um, weren't the thing. We did parachute drops. You know, training parachute guys. Um, we'd be on the way to Thompson Oot of a morning. We'd just take a, a group of Arvin troops out and drop them over DZ and then uh, head to Saigon. 
what 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 do you believe was the most um exciting dangerous attention grabbing situation you got involved in while you're up there we we were put in pretty hazardous situations i remember i'd been there about a month or six weeks and we were called out to do uh, um, an evacuation uh, down the delta at a place called Jamat. And um, it had been hit overnight and hit heavily. I mean heavily. Um, and we were called in. Uh, we arrived there about 8 o'clock. There's heavy overcast, 9 tenths overcast. Uh, we were supposed to have a uh, Skyrider fighter escort. It was too hard for them. And um, um, I was flying with Doug Harvey, who was CO at that time, and he... Um, Doug, Doug is an old Lancaster pilot, and he says, well, we've got to get through. They need us, and we're bringing in mainly ammunition at that time and a, a bit of fuel for them. And um, Doug uh, Doug did a bit of a, a drop down, about 50 to 100 feet. We cleared the cloud. Uh, we weren't quite over the airstrip, so Doug slides, slides through pretty heavily. Uh, but when we were there, all we could hear was rat, tat, tat, tat. And um, the Americans knew we were coming and had actually lined both sides of the airstrip to allow us to to um, uh, land. And uh, very, very quickly, we, we shunted in, got the ammunition out. Uh, they'd loaded quite a few Americans. Um, and then um, uh, the Special Forces guys, uh, and we flew them about 15 minutes away to a place called Song Bay. And then we, we, we returned a couple of times. We took uh, casualties out. By that time, we were getting a bit, bit short of fuel. Consonant was about half an hour away. Would have been a little bit over half an hour. And um, um, they decided we'd carry the dead Americans back. And when they loaded the Americans on the aircraft, uh, despite the claim that they're in uh, in body bags, they weren't. They're just in a mm-hmm. sling bitter. Uh, and uh, we brought them back to Thompson Newt. But the worst part about it is when we got to Thompson Newt, it took about an hour and a half to two hours at midday uh, in the steaming heat to uh, bring out the body bags in the ambulances. Mm-hmm. It was fun. We went back again um, to the map. It had settled down quite a bit. And um, the American Special Forces guys uh, asked us to come in. By that time, we had fighter escort, but it was, forget it, it's a waste of time. Um, we went into the living area. They had aluminium huts there. And outside the huts were barbed wire enclosures, and there were VC piled up there, honestly. Uh, it was horrendous. Um, within the huts, there were friendlies. And once again, there's many, many dead in there. Um, and uh, one of the Yanks took me around the side and said, come and have a look at the VC, went around there, and he said, stop there. I was about oh, half a metre from the barbed wire, and he said, look down, and there's a bloody landmine there. So I nearly put, put myself out in the <laughs> land. Uh, so all I said was, oh, golly, <laughs> or similar. Uh, so how long were you there for? I was in Vietnam for a bit over 10 months. Not capture pretty... Uh... Pretty alert and pretty much with a lot of adrenaline runs. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the the we were we we're quite limited in the amount of personnel we had. Um, we had a, a medical orderly, a doctor. Uh, sorry, a sergeant medical orderly. Uh, no doctors. We had to rely on the Americans. Um, none of our records were ever recorded, so we've got no info of what happened there. But um, we were up uh, up usually about four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, we did three weeks straight, three weeks straight. Um, we had one spare loadmaster, assistant loadmaster, and that guy, um, as your turn came around, you had three days off, and you were that assistant, that uh, duty loady. You met the, you took the crew of the aircraft, you um, picked them up from the aircraft, you uh, went into town. We had no messing facilities, so we all pitched in on the black market, of course, mm. and uh, uh, bought food in the local village, bread, etc. We got a bit of Vegemite brought from home, a bit of butter, 
and whatever we stole in our uh, in our flights, like uh, frozen steak and such. I imagine you had a norm in Australia, like most of us have a norm, like a normal day, but it's the sort of thing we might expect to happen during the day. What was your new norm in Vietnam for uh, for for all those months? What what became your new norm for life? Get up early, get out, get showered if you could, um, without waking your mates up because you're about three to four to a room, and uh, get dressed, get your weapons, uh, get on the on the truck, go out the base, get on the aircraft, taxi up to uh, the ramp amongst a half a dozen aircraft or more, load your load, whatever you're taking to Thompson Hood, um, and uh, take off, and then you do your your run, whatever it might be. So, as I say, at, at days they're very boring, very repetitive. Other days, but you never knew what to expect. And your aircraft were very reliable. Um, the, the, our ground crew were amazing, absolutely amazing. They worked all night. Yeah. So. Um, uh, we had five aircraft every day, right, wrong, or indifferent, and um, that 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 was that was magnificent. So, did you um, lose or have da- um, significant damage to a caribou while you were there? I wouldn't call it significant. Uh, One seventy three okay. had gone in at Anne Howe, um, and um, it was actually had been recovered. That's all the caribou. Uh, they put an American wing on, yeah, um, off a of caribou, and uh, it was at uh, Vung Tau when I arrived. Um, all chained up, the undercarriage and everything, and uh, uh, they eventually recovered it and uh, uh, flew again. So, yeah. um, um, it was interesting. We, you know, um, you never knew what you're going to get. Um, times you'd be bringing in entertainers. It was before the army arrived. I was. The army had just just started to arrive on the Sydney when I left, right. uh, but um, uh, it was interesting. You'd pick up people, American entertainers, Wayne Newton, and uh, Australians, Lucky Star, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you bring them in, and that you know, to, uh, take them around the Delta somewhere or to an outpost. Did your lot? Did your awareness of life and what you wanted change after you came back from Vietnam? Did were there new importances in your life after what you've experienced? Oh, yes. Yeah. Look, um, in a way, um, we were lucky. We were never exposed to massive danger. Um, I've got nothing but the respect for the Army and uh, what they achieved after I'd left. Um, we we interfaced with the American Green Beret guys all the time. And they were magnificent. They were always in a hazardous situation. They never knew what happened. Um, we were the first into play coup. Play coup was hit uh, on, uh, on the Cambodian border. Um, some two to three weeks, they were undergoing uh, massive uh, fighting there. And we were the first aircraft to land there. And, of course, we blew a tyre. Uh, we shrapped on with there for a couple of hours. And we had to improvise to get the uh, the wheel back on, but um, those guys they they were around us. They they wanted to talk, they wanted to tell us what happened. They showed us what happened with play two. They took us out because it was safe at that time. While we were waiting for the tide to arrive, and we had a look at the the way the VC had actually and the Arvins had actually uh, come in and tunnelled right up to the boundaries. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got photos of it, but you you really can't pick it up. You can't. The, 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 and the VC, well, the Arvin and, and VC lost a lot of men, and the Yanks lost a lot of people too. But yeah, right. Oh, that was a that was a fairly um, stressful time in your life, and um, I'm glad you I'm glad you're back here now, um, <laughs> creating mischief. So I'd like to thank you for your um your talk with me and um and uh I I salute the people who put themselves on the line and kept their sense of humor somehow 
and came home. Uh, and for those that didn't, I, I give them a bigger salute. So thanks very much, Gluey, for talking with me. And um, we'll, we'll anything else you want to finalise with? Well, Pete, um, the I come home seven stone ten ringing wreck. Um, I wasn't super well. Um, I my PTSD had arrived, and it was pretty significant. And um, my squadron mates um, gave us. We supported each other. Mm. We all went through it. And uh, we supported each other. It was tough love. And when I got home, the the messing facilities uh, at uh, Richmond, particularly, uh, was the also very supportive. You'd go to a mess, uh, or you go to the booze and more, didn't they? And uh, once again, you got tough love, and that pulls you through. Um, the the Worst part about it is, um, and I, uh, not not only myself but other other assistant load masters, masters um, when we came home, uh, I was I was firmly a part of Thirty Eight Squad. And I basically ran ran the social clubs, everything at Thirty Eight before I went overseas. When I come home, I was immediately posted out of Thirty Eight Squadron, as they couldn't have a, a, a corporal general hand. He had a combat experience in lots and lots of hours on a caribou, flying and receiving flight pay, receiving American uh, flight recognition. They could not have that person in the squadron, and I don't don't understand their mentality there. Uh, we never received any recognition from the Air Force. We never received our brevet, um, so that was disappointing. Mm. So, literally, that's. Uh, that was the only sad outcome of it. Mm -hmm. Well, mate, thanks for your service, and um, I'll catch up with you elsewhere. Okay, Pete. Cheers, mate. See you, mate.